And to be completely honest and upfront with you, that's kind of a problem in our viewpoint. If you're here looking for a stock to buy for that reason, that could be highly problematic. Maybe it's like the next Berkshire Hathaway in just doing this exceptional job of acquiring businesses at attractive values and then letting them do their thing. We don't know yet which the final outcome is going to be. Hey everyone, welcome back to Chipstock Investor Roadshow Edition. We're taking a quick break from our vacation here to update everyone on some Broadcom news. Broadcom, as you no doubt have noticed, has been on a tear recently. Broadcom had its earnings release last week, as well as Raspberry Pi's IPO, which is very pertinent to Broadcom. And Broadcom also announced a 10 for 1 stock split coming up as well. And on that note, we're going to put 10 for 1 stock split in the title of this video. We haven't come up with a title as of yet for this recording, but we'll probably somehow get AI and NVIDIA stock in there as well. And according to our data, this video will probably get lots of clicks as a result. And to be completely honest and upfront with you, that's kind of a problem in our viewpoint. If you're here looking for a stock to buy for that reason, that could be highly problematic. A video that absolutely tanked was the last video that we just uploaded on Airbnb. Very, very few people were interested in it. And honestly, that might be pretty informative to our upcoming list of top stocks to buy for the second half of 2024 and beyond. Stay tuned for that later on here in June. Just thought I'd kind of throw that out there though on Broadcom. There's a lot of AI and semiconductor chip stock hype going on right now. And folks, be choosy with what you're purchasing. And if you're in doubt, an ETF is probably a fantastic option at this point. Okay, Broadcom earnings. Broadcom is a behemoth of a semiconductor company. You can see that their revenue for fiscal year 2023 clocked in at nearly $36 billion. They have one of the industry's broadest IP portfolios with 23,000 patents. Broadcom is an absolute giant in the semiconductor industry. But let's talk about how we got here in the first place. Here's a timeline that Broadcom provides on how they became this massive enterprise semiconductor and software empire. So the company actually has its roots at HP. Decades ago, they, they were HP's in-house semiconductor design segment. That was eventually spun out and became a company known as Avego, which had an IPO in late 2008, early 2009. They made a number of acquisitions and then that culminated in the acquisition of the company Broadcom in 2016, which Avego then adopted the name Broadcom and eventually redomiciled from Singapore, where it was headquartered prior to San Jose, California. One of the big reasons for that acquisition of Broadcom, changing the name and then relocating to California was because the company was trying to make some other big acquisitions in the semiconductor world. They attempted to acquire actually Qualcomm during this period of time as well. That got shot down by regulators. And so in recent years, as a result of its size and elevated scrutiny, CEO Hock Tan of Broadcom made this pivot to a more software focused acquisition strategy. We'll circle back to this later on because of course, VMware, the mega acquisition of VMware is key to the story going forward. Let's focus on our semiconductor industry flow here just for a moment to give everyone a refresher on exactly where Broadcom fits into the industry. They are primarily a fabulous chip designer, but they do have some integrated device manufacturing as well. They do have some factories for their own chips. And then as we mentioned at the outset, they have tons of IP and do provide a lot of enterprise software. And this is a unique looking layout for the semi-industry flow, Broadcom kind of all over the place. And again, this just goes back to the fact that this has been an acquisition heavy business strategy that CEO Hock Tan has pursued. And if we go back to the very first slide that we provided at the outset, there are 26 category leading semi and infrastructure software divisions. This has led some to call Broadcom sort of a private equity type of business model. The strategy of making an acquisition of a product, stripping it down to its most profitable core, and then operating it in very lean, highly profitable fashion. We'll come back to this again, because this is, of course, very important when talking about VMware, because that's the most recent 
big acquisition and Broadcom very much in the midst of doing that exactly with VMware, stripping it down to its most profitable core. And there is some controversy surrounding that strategy. At any rate, if you're a shareholder of Broadcom, you're probably pretty happy with the financial results. Let's go back in time and take a look at Broadcom's sales segments for Q1 fiscal 2024. That was the quarter previous to the one that just reported. You can see in that networking row at the very top, full year networking guide was at 35% year over year growth for 2024. Networking is primarily the data center AI portion of Broadcom's business. And then shift your focus down to infrastructure software. They expected that the software revenue to be at 20 billion for the full year in 2024. Now that is including VMware at the end of fiscal year 2023, there was no VMware revenue. Now we have a slide that focuses on this most recent quarter, and you can see that they've increased their full year expectation for networking to 40% year over year growth. And the software revenue has increased 175% with that addition of VMware included in the revenue. They expect the full year revenue to still be 20 billion. And here's what that looks like in total semiconductor solutions sales up 6% year over year. Now, most of that, again, driven by the networking and AI growth, offsetting some sizable year-over-year -year declines elsewhere in the business. By now, if you've been following along with us for some time, you know that pretty much the entire semiconductor industry is still actually in a down cycle, a bear market, if you will, except for AI and high-performance compute infrastructure, especially for data centers. Infrastructure software, 175% year-over-year growth because of VMware but there is actually some pretty good organic growth going on from some of those past acquisitions, Brocade in particular, that help companies deploy their on-premises computing infrastructure, on-prem data centers. But ultimately what we're looking at here, because of that AI growth in the networking segment, Broadcom is now roughly a 60 percent, 40 percent split between semiconductors at 60 percent and infrastructure software at 40 percent. This is a very unique business at this point. And Casey, you alluded to the size of Broadcom. There's an interesting thing that happens when a company like this reaches such epic proportions. And it's that whenever you have smaller businesses that have an IPO, for example, as you mentioned, Raspberry Pi, there's probably a pretty good chance that, that company is highly reliant on some industry titan. And that seems to be the case here, right? Yeah, this is an excellent point, Nick, because Raspberry Pi might be very interesting to some investors, but they are very reliant on a behemoth like Broadcom. Notice what Raspberry Pi said in, about Broadcom in their IPO filing. They said that virtually all of their past and current system on chips or compute modules utilize Broadcom semiconductors. Raspberry Pi 4 and Raspberry Pi 5 and their derivatives also use a Broadcom GPHY networking semiconductor. With that said, Raspberry Pi notes that they are exposed to all of the foregoing risks pursuant to the terms of our strategic collaboration agreement between their company and Broadcom because they are required to purchase 9.4 million system on chips per year. And that commitment is all the way from 2024 to 2027. Take away here. If you're interested in the Raspberry Pi IPO or a lot of other semiconductor IPOs for that matter right now, if you do some digging in the filings, you're likely to find them reliant on one of the industry leaders or some other tech giant for that matter. Raspberry Pi is no exception. We are more than content to pass on the Raspberry Pi IPO and get some indirect exposure to the business via Broadcom. Raspberry Pi sales actually do seem to fall within this networking segment of Broadcom. This is a slide that Broadcom provides that outlines what they do. And let me just back it up here for just a moment, Casey, with this chart that you put together. You can see networking there in the top row, 3.8 billion. This segment, networking, which encompasses AI, now accounts for over half of the semiconductor business and a pretty large chunk, let's call it a third, of Broadcom's revenue overall. What is networking exactly? It's a lot of stuff, Nick. This slide includes a, a ton of products from Broadcom. They go all the way from the switching to routing. They have stuff in the physical layer, optical interconnects, and ethernet. And 
a lot of that growth that we have seen in the networking segment has a lot to do with, of course, AI data centers, that hyperscale data center that you see on the right of the chart. The hyperscalers, that would include Google Cloud, which is a top customer. Let me circle back to that here in just a second. It could also include Meta, Microsoft Azure, Amazon AWS, Oracle Cloud, Alibaba, Tencent, you name it. If there's an internet-based business that operates big data centers, you can safely lump them into the hyperscaler segment. And there's a pretty good chance that Broadcom services them as they look to implement some of this accelerated compute and AI infrastructure into their data center fleet. Now, before we talk about Google and some of the hyperscaler customers in particular that are helping fuel some of Broadcom's AI growth, this is an interesting quote from the earnings call. Yes, CEO Hawk Tan was asked about the split between compute offload and networking AI revenue, which as you mentioned, Nick, is primarily Google. He said that it's something we don't really predict very well nor understand completely except in hindsight because the cadence of deployment when they put in the AI accelerators versus when they put it in the infrastructure that puts it together, the networking, they don't understand it 100%. What Broadcom does know is that it used to be around 80% accelerators, 20% networking, but now it's running closer to two thirds accelerators, one third networking. And eventually it would be heading towards a 60 40 split by the close of this year. This is a highly relevant quote because companies like Broadcom and its peer, I specifically say peer, not competitor, NVIDIA, are highly reliant on these customers like Google for their sales as well as a lot of other customers. But at this particular stage of the AI infrastructure build out, it's mostly those hyperscalers. This quote is interesting because it is a bit of an admission that Broadcom doesn't have the level of visibility that they might like to on what their customers are doing with their chips. Now, we've covered this in a number of videos, including in our Broadcom Accelerated Compute coverage back in March. They actually had an AI event the same week NVIDIA had its GTC event. Here are a few slides from that. You can see that Broadcom, its oldest customer over the last decade or so is with Google. They helped co-develop the TPU or tensor processing unit for Google. They have a couple of new customers now that are also in development and quickly moving into the manufacturing phase. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing more than likely going to be handling most of that. And we broke down what some of the accelerated computing chips versus the networking chip infrastructure actually looks like. And included in that, we did our own mock-up on what that compute offload workload actually looks like as a computing request enters a data center, how Broadcom chips kind of filter out what needs to be offloaded, and then what compute workloads can continue on to the traditional part of the data center as well as what some of those chips actually look like, as well as the broad ecosystem of companies Broadcom works with to help supply some of those hyperscalers, as well as some of the smaller customers that also operate their own data centers. If you want more of a breakdown on this, check out that video from back in March. We also did a video on NVIDIA's custom compute segment that happened not long after that. And then we'll copy and paste some of the old show notes into these show notes, if that's of interest to you. You can find those over on our Kofi channel, or if you're a Semiconductor Insider member, you can find those over on Discord as well. Let's shift our focus back over to that software segment, especially in the light of that VMware acquisition that completed in 2023. Broadcom has a lot of software solutions for businesses, enterprise businesses. You can see endpoint security, identity and access management, all the way up into the far right where it says cloud infrastructure, all of those to the left of cloud infrastructure are from previous acquisitions, Brocade, as Nick mentioned earlier, and CA Technologies, and in cybersecurity, Symantec. But taking a look at the cloud infrastructure portion, that is where VMware comes into play, as well as on the left side of the top portion of this infographic, mainframe, hybrid cloud, and distributed software. Now, we mentioned Broadcom's controversial strategy where they make these acquisitions and they offload what they deem to be non-core products. They've also been reshuffling their partner network. VMware, as CEO Hawk Tan mentioned in the last earnings call, has something like 30,000 customers. Now, it's really like the top 10,000 customers that account for 
most of the revenue. So there's a long tail, let's call it 20,000 of smaller customers that don't make up all that much of the VMware core product. And so there's a bit of chaos in Hoktan's words going on as they kind of reshuffle their go-to-market strategy. Let's just call it unpopular among those 20,000 smaller customers. But what is that core product? It's a virtual machine called a hypervisor. A hypervisor is a type of enterprise software that takes a server that operates either in a data center or it could be an on-premises mainframe. It takes that server and is able to partition out the computing power of that server so that multiple applications and multiple users can all share the use of it, creating those multiple virtual machines handled by a single server. That core product is called vSphere at VMware, and that is really what attracted Broadcom. It's an old software technology, and they're working at making it as high a profit margin as it has done with the older software acquisitions that it's made, infrastructure, management software, and some enterprise cybersecurity. Go back to this revenue breakdown one more time, because for all of the noise going on about Broadcom's very, very unpopular decision with VMware, some smaller customers are jumping ship and leaving for other hypervisor providers like uh, Nutanix, another publicly traded stock. Some of the larger customers are actually quite happy. And so from Q1 to Q2, fiscal 2024, you can actually see VMware specific revenue actually increased sequentially, which is partly because in Q1, it wasn't quite a full quarter of revenue for VMware yet. Q2 is the first quarter where we have a complete three months of VMware revenue. But even when you factor for that, there was, it seems, at the very least, stable, if not rising quarter over quarter revenue for VMware because of those larger customers actually being happy with some of the changes that Broadcom has instituted. Highly unpopular, the smaller customers are going to move to a rival service, but Broadcom doing what Broadcom does best and whittling down the product to its most profitable core and keeping its most important customers happy. There was no upgrade to the software revenue guidance of 20 billion, but VMware very much on course to reaching something like a 60% operating profit margin, which is like the operating margin target for many of Broadcom's acquisitions. So if you're a shareholder, this is all pretty good news. Let's shift our focus now to the stock split. That's always something that creates a bit of investor excitement. Broadcom announced that they're going to be doing a 10 for one stock split on July 12th. So why are we thinking that they're doing a stock split right at this point? It, this may look like a familiar slide. We've borrowed it from our LAM research video a few weeks ago. We also talked about this when NVIDIA announced its 10 for one stock split. So Broadcom really just joining the party from an investor standpoint, it feels like a party, but <laughs> what's actually happening is this is a pretty good way for Broadcom to manage its employee stock-based compensation, chief among those employees being none other than CEO Hock Tan, as well as the Semiconductor Solutions Group president, Dr. Charlie Collis. It also helps a bit with share buybacks, which is a key part of Broadcom's shareholder return policy. You know, they pay the dividend, but also stock buybacks they make pretty consistently as well. So splitting the stock price down helps with that management. As far as those stock awards go, Tan and Kawas actually both achieved milestones here in the last year as Broadcom stock has steadily risen. There's going to be about 1.3 million new shares that vest over the next few years for Mr. Tan and Mr. Kawas, as outlined in this 2022 compensation outline that we pulled here for Broadcom. Now, Broadcom generates plenty of profit. They were purchased plenty of stock that will more than likely offset these stock awards. I think, nevertheless, the point is, this is probably one of the key reasons that there was a stock split announced. Whenever you have big increases in revenue, employees tend to get stock awards. And splitting the stock price down into smaller bits will help Broadcom manage the payouts of those. But what about for retail investors? Casey, explain to us why a 10 for one stock split is something that you can safely just ignore. You can take a look at this graphic that we have. On the left side, you have a pizza divided into four slices and a pizza on the right divided into many slices. Where you had one slice before, now you have 10. The amount of pizza is the same. 
Ultimately, the value for us as retail investors does not change with the stock split. Okay. With that out of the way, let's talk about valuation because this is pertinent to retail investors as Broadcom has skyrocketed out of obscurity the last couple of years, maybe especially the last year with all of the AI hype. We've called out some risk that perhaps Broadcom is the next General Electric, which maybe isn't completely fair. General Electric has completed its three-way split into three separate companies earlier this year. And one of them, GE Vernova, is one that we will cover in an upcoming video. But maybe it's like the next Berkshire Hathaway in just doing this exceptional job of acquiring businesses at attractive values and then letting them do their thing. We don't know yet which the final outcome is going to be. Let's talk about some valuation notes that we have after the most recent report and subsequent stock jump here in June of 2024. The expected fiscal year 2024 revenue has been increased from 50 billion to now 51 billion due to that networking segment, chip sales. The adjusted EBITDA was previously guided to a 60% margin, which would be 30 billion. That's now increased to 61% or 31.1 billion. As that VMware acquisition is consolidated, adjusted EBITDA, we believe, is a useful measure of underlying operational performance. Gap net income and free cash flow will become more meaningful over the next year as those integration expenses decrease and margins will converge with adjusted EBITDA. If you read through the financial filings, Broadcom management noted that there was about $2 billion worth in charges that impacted gap net income and free cash flow. And so adjusted EBITDA backs out those $2 billion in charges to see what Broadcom would be able to do once VMware is fully integrated into the rest of the software division. So that's why adjusted EBITDA has become an important metric, at least at this particular juncture. We're going to come back though to net income and free cash flow and do a reverse discount cash flow analysis. But first, Casey, tell us about the balance sheet because that's another area of possible concern. Yeah, absolutely. At the beginning of May of this year, cash and short-term investments were $9.8 billion and a massive debt of $74 billion. CFO Kirsten Spears made this comment regarding this debt the Broadcom has. They had $48 billion before the VMware acquisition in debt, and it's only at a 3.5% interest rate. Now, after the VMware acquisition, they added $28 billion in debt for that acquisition, and that is at a 6.6% interest rate. So they are highly motivated to get that portion of debt paid down, that $28 billion. And so they're doing that in increments of about $2 billion per quarter. And that's been through this first half of the fiscal year 2024. Now, $48 billion in basically fixed rate debt that they had prior to VMware, it's still a high burden of debt. As you mentioned, 3.5% interest rate. It's a very, very low interest rate. It's good for the next eight years. So that's a actually pretty comfortable level of indebtedness for a company like Broadcom, given their profitability profile and ability to service that debt. Again, this is an area of risk that's worth monitoring. If you're thinking about and trying to figure out if Broadcom is some sort of future general electric that overextends its reach, or if it's a very enduring long-term investment like Berkshire Hathaway, keeping an eye on the balance sheet is of prime importance. Okay, I promised we would get back to gap net income and free cash flow. So let's do that and do a reverse DCF to try to see what the market is expecting to happen to justify the current valuation as fair value. Let's start with the stock price of around $1,740, which would bring us to a market cap of around $805 billion. The stock trades for around 26 times expected full year adjusted EBITDA. So what we've done is we've taken a blend of gap earnings per share over the last 12 months of $23.25, and we've blended that with free cash flow per share of $41 over the last trailing 12 months to arrive at $32.13. Now, if we assume that the gap earnings per share based on net income and free cash flow per share do indeed converge with the adjusted EBITDA figure over the course of the next year and a half or so, as VMware is integrated and whittled down to its most profitable core, 
it seems that to get us to that fair value of, well, let's just call it $1,700 per share or an 805 billion market cap, the blended per share profit should go up about 40% in the next year and a half. And then assuming a 7% terminal growth rate after that and a 10% discount rate, that's what gets us to a fair value of about $1,700 per share right now. And so the question becomes, is this a reasonable hurdle for Broadcom? And I think the answer is yes, it's reasonable. Is the stock cheap? Absolutely not. Even with all of that networking and AI growth, this is not a cheap stock, but it is reasonable, we believe. You probably know, again, if you've seen some of our recent videos, we did decide to consolidate our portfolio a little bit. We exited a longtime position in Marvell, uh, which we have called Baby Broadcom over the years. And most of the proceeds we've been funneling back into Broadcom stock. We think it will remain the market leader for many years to come. Not a cheap value stock at this point, though. That's why I felt like we needed to mention at the outset of this video that our last video on Airbnb and a lot of other videos on very high quality businesses that generate plenty of profitability, getting very little attention from the investor community, being pretty indicative of where we should probably be spending a bit more time and a bit more attention for our investment dollars at this particular juncture, right? Broadcom, it's a fantastic business. There's no denying that. It is. However, maybe you are just starting out or you don't have Broadcom already in your portfolio. It may not be the timeliest of buys. So we will focus on some more timely buys in our upcoming videos. So make sure you check that out. Make sure you have the subscribe button clicked and notifications turned on. And we do have a lot of discussion over on our Discord channel on all sorts of companies that we like and are, that are in our chip stock investor portfolio. Make sure you check that out. Semiconductor Insider is only $5 a month. It gets you access to the Discord channel as well as our show notes and published manuals. Link in the description below. We're told by some of our subscribers, it's a pretty good value. We'll let you decide though. Sign up. Do it. We'll see you all very soon here at Chipstock Investor. Take care, everyone.